Hello, everyone. I'm Becca, dietitian by trade, mom 24-7, wife from the start, and when there's a few extra hours in the day, you might find me hitting the trails or on horseback. And I'm Kara, a therapist to women, a mom to a boy, an entrepreneur, mountain junkie, and a postpartum runner. And this is Fit for a Queen, a podcast that's devoted to the female athlete wanting to balance the teeter-totter of all the things we desire out of life as women. Performance, health, intellect, and taking time for self, even if we only get one minute out of the day. We're so excited to be bringing you the queens in the athletic world who have done just that. Okay, ladies, take a seat at your thrones, grab your crowns, and welcome to Fit for a Queen. Welcome back, uh, Fit Queens. We're really excited to have Renee McGregor here and talk about her new movement, um, hashtag uh, Train Brave. So Renee is a leading sports and eating disorder specialist dietitian with over 15 years experience working in clinical and performance nutrition with the Olympics London 2012, Paralympics Rio 2016, and Commonwealth teams in Queenlands in 2018. She works with individuals, athletes of all levels and ages, coaches, and sports science teams to provide nutritional strategies to enhance sports performance and manage eating disorders. She is presently working with a number of national governing bodies and professional endurance teams, including the Scottish Gymnastics, the GB 24-Hour Running Squad, the EA Marathon Development Squad, and pro cyclists and triathletes. She is regularly asked to work directly with high-performing and professional athletes that have developed a dysfunctional relationship with food that is impacting their performance, health, and career. She is the co-founder of Hashtag Train Brave, a campaign raising the awareness of eating disorders in sport, providing resources and practical strategies to reduce the prevalence. Her aim is to empower balance in a performance-driven world. She's on the Red S Advisory Board for BASIS, the British Association of Sport and Exercise Science, and sits on the International Task Force for Orthorexia. Renee has been invited to speak at several high-profile events, including the European Eating Disorder Society Annual Conference as the UK expert in orthorexia, the Cheltenham Literature Festival, the Cheltenham Science Festival, the Stylist Show, and Google. She writes for many national publications and is often asked to comment in the national press. She regularly contributes to radio and TV, including Newsnight and BBC Five Live. Welcome to um, Fit for a Queen, Queen Renee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's a bit of a long introduction, isn't it? <laughs> well, <laughs> you're very accomplished. <laughs> we got to share all of it. <laughs> well deserved. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, tell us how your career led to you focusing on orthorexia and athletes with eating disorders. We'd like to know about that. So I started actually back in the day with a biochemistry degree. That's always been my passion. Like I love understanding what's going on uh, at a kind of biological level cellular level and I just really just loved my degree um, and I guess I was really lucky I had a, an amazing mentor um, at university where I was at Nottingham and um, he he really encouraged me to kind of think about my long-term career he said you know you're you know you obviously you have this passion but I think you've got this um, ability to use it and make it more practical so why don't you look into um, a career in sort of dietetics and, and and see if if that would be right for you. So um I sort of took his advice and realized that that was actually a really good a good path for me to go down and so I then went on to do a postgraduate and qualified as a dietitian and I guess spent the first few years as most dietitians do um in clinical practice working within hospital settings and I guess I I, I can't I can't you know I can't fault that. I mean it's the best grounding for any practitioner to kind of have that real clinical background where you're working on different wards with different clinical presentations and you're learning to interact with um, different multidisciplinary teams. You know, you learn so much, not just about your, your, your physical work, but you learn about the whole setup and, and how to interact with different people and how to think on your feet as well. So um, I did that and that kind of, um, gave me really good grounding and the sort of the last few jobs I did within the National Health Service here in the UK were all um, 
eating disorder orientated. Mm-hmm. So I basically worked mainly with eating disorders in, in those last few years of my clinical practice. And I guess I just got to a stage where I became quite frustrated by the limitations of working within clinical practice here in the in the NHS because it was all it's all all kind of uh, based on funding and uh, what's available and what postcode you are and and I just was like this is this is not the practitioner I want to be you know I want to be accessible to everybody and I want to be able to think outside the box and use practices that you know maybe aren't um, what is dictated by the protocols of, of of the hospital, but actually are still really valid, but they're just new and and not being kind of absorbed into sometimes quite arch- archaic and old school mm-hmm. thoughts. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that, yes. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, so I I guess it felt like a na- it felt like a good time to have a break and think about where I wanted to go. And I've always been a keen sportswoman myself. I've always done lots of sport. um, And I was doing a lot of running at this point. And um, a lot of my peers within the running club kept asking me questions about nutrition. And I was like, well, yeah, I can answer these, but this is me and I like to be credible and I like to be qualified. And so I decided that I would go down the road of doing a postgrad in applied sports nutrition, which was fantastic. And I loved it again because it sort of took me back to my biochemical physiology roots. And I was like, okay, this is great. Um, and I guess I thought I'd put all that kind of clinical eating disorder work behind me. But the first job I landed was working with the rhythmic gymnastics squad mm-hmm. going into the uh-huh. 12 so um and the reason I got the job was because of my clinical background mm-hmm. um obviously sporting background as well but mainly because my clinical background and so I guess I've although I've worked in many different sports over the last you know eight years I've I guess they've all been with a slight clinical angle and when I've worked with running or or triathlon or cycling while you know I'd say maybe sort of 40% of the cases have just been about performance nutrition and improving performance probably 60% of the cases have always been those that have got slightly dysfunctional relationships with mm-hmm. food mm-hmm. and and so it became very apparent to me that there was a real um, gap in knowledge in this area and it was something I could do I could bridge that kind of clinical and sports field which very few um, people were doing within 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 the UK um so that's kind of how I ended up working in most recent years as I guess um a sports dietitian specializing in eating disorders and and the kind of orthorexia came about because I was doing I guess I I, I mean we probably all do it because we're, we're dietitians but you know you put your head above a bit of a parapet at times because you're kind of trying to speak out about against all these these ridiculous food trends and food fads that come our way every single year. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, oh, yeah. Eating. Oh um, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, it's just big, isn't it? It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And I was invited to speak at the Cheltenham Literature Festival um, as part of a panel on on this kind of clean eating debate. And interesting experience. Um, it, it basically, there was myself. Um, a really good food historian called B. Wilson, who is incredible, and I have a lot of respect for her. Um, and then there was a, a food blogger um, called Madeline Shaw. I don't know if she's particularly big in the States, but she's huge here in the UK. Mm. And um, we were all asked to kind of talk about clean eating and, and our practices and why we think it's bad, et cetera, et cetera. Except, you know, Madeline's books at the time were very much pro clean eating Mm -hmm. so um, she came across like she sort of I guess we were asked what our thoughts were and we were you know I was very open about the fact that I'm seeing more and more individuals in clinic really stuck in a in a trap because of this whole this belief that if they don't eat in a certain way then somehow they're eating dirty and how that's affecting their psychology Mm -hmm. around how they see themselves and and Madeline was sort of sat there kind of like but then we were like, but your book says. Right, mm-hmm. right, right. Mm-hmm. you got to walk book. the walk and talk the talk. Absolutely. But but basically what happened was the audience that was there, which was about 400 people, wow. um, 
they turned against me and B because mm. they saw an attack on their almost their guru. I mean, it was it was like yeah. it was like an evangelistic cult. I cannot say it to me. And um, poor B and I got really really lynched because Madeline basically burst into tears on stage because she had nothing. To, to offer back. I don't even think she wrote her book, to be honest. Oh, like gosh. she didn't even remember what was in it. So um so basically off the back of that, um I was all I already have a relationship with a publishing company because they'd asked me to write um books on sports nutrition previously that had done really well and they contacted me to write about orthorexia. Mm-hmm. Let's just get it out there. And so mm-hmm. that's kind of how I guess Somehow I was propelled then into this being the expert. And actually it was um, uh, Jessica, um, I can never say her surname. Uh, Yes, yeah, Jessica Mm -hmm. who contacted me this time last year and said, look, I've read your book, it's great. Um, um, On this uh, this conference in Rome, in, in, it was March, I think we went. Um, and it was incredible. Like, uh, suddenly I was like, oh, okay. I mean, you know, I, I love my job and I love speaking truth and evidence based, as we all do as dietitians. And I don't ever think about what the outcome's going to be. It's just, I want to get really good messages across. And I suppose that that's basically how I've ended up where I am today is just following my path to speak truth and educate everybody mm-hmm. as much as I possibly can. And, and, and it works, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. Renee, just in case our listeners are not aware, can you define what orthorexia is? Sure. So orthorexia, when you break it down, it is the um, the definition is basically the obsession with eating correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's that obsession with eating purely or cleanly in, in the case of clean eating. And so, so basically it's not necessarily around weight loss. Um, which we obviously see with with anorexia and bulimia. It's not about kind of control of weight or or restricting calories or anything like that. It's very much about eating in a way that they believe will enhance health and will will somehow um, kind of keep you clean. That's the only way I can really describe it. You know, it's about being sure. Um, So you don't always see a change in body composition or anything like that, but you do often see... Um, deficiencies because it still a, can become quite a restrictive way of eating. Right, right. So I have to say, I'm probably like your number one retweeter. I'm so <laughs> excited for your new movement called Train Brave. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> so much. I mean, we we have we've literally. I mean, I think Tom and I are just uh, hugely overwhelmed by the support we've had, particularly since Sunday when, when we actually launched the event. But but basically, Train Brave is a campaign we have launched to try and raise awareness of eating disorders um, and relative energy deficiency in sport. Um, because we, so Tom, Tom is an individual, he works, um, we have Park Run here, and he works for Park Run, he's a runner, and he has his own story, but basically developed bulimia as, um, as a result of kind of trying to improve his performance and being in a culture and environment within his his sports club that kind of made him feel like he had to go to extreme measures to um to get the results he wanted basically um and he's been through a huge journey and bless him he's he's doing brilliantly he's just had he just got a pb at valencia marathon like three weeks ago now being actually restored weight mm. and eating properly and just being an all-round great guy to be That's honest great. and um so he contacted me back in may i think it was or maybe it was april i can't remember but he basically had heard me on um a, a podcast called bad boy podcast in the uk and i'd been talking about um about you know eating disorders in sport and why it's a problem and um and i think he he kind of just immediately was like right i need to get in touch with her because i think this is somebody i can work with who, who we can work together and, and kind of change things and I'd sort of been saying the same thing is that I needed I wanted somebody to partner with is too much to take on board on your own I mean my clinic is ridiculously full I mean I don't have any space at the moment until the middle of January you know it's mm-hmm. it's it's busy mm-hmm. and I also do, do a lot of lecturing and present you know presenting at conferences so life is is busy and <laughs> I knew knew I want but I knew that I it, I needed to do more because obviously I can't reach everybody 
directly just through my clinic and I wanted to reach as many people as possible so when Tom contacted me it was a it was great. We hit it off immediately and we both wanted the same thing. We're both on the same wavelength and we had this long discussion about, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to create? And I said, I said to him, I think the thing is that there's, there's bits and pieces going on in the elite world. I mean, having worked in that field, I know that, you know, they are trying to, they are trying to create um, monitoring tools and they are trying to change um they're trying to help those that are affected, but there's nothing for the general population. You know, like the majority of people who are what we would call our, you know, weekend warriors, our recreational athletes, who are still really, really determined and focused and still kind of make up the majority of all our running, triathlon, cycling clubs in the whole of the UK. Like there was, there's, there's nothing for those people. There's no, there's nothing being developed. And so we, we we talked about like should we develop fact sheets should we do um like online courses or, or what should we do and in the end we decided you know what let's just let's just run an event let's run a campaign and an event and launch it and let's hear from the people that, that need the support let's hear from them what do they want from us what is it that they they require so basically we put it out there and we were just blown away by the fact that you know, you know, like um, publications like um, Runners World, mm-hmm. Tr- uh, mm-hmm. Athletics Weekly, um, Fast Running, they all got behind us. They all wrote articles for us. They all promoted it. They all pushed it. I've done quite a lot of podcasts. You know, I've been invited to lots of different things. Um, on Sunday before the event, we um, Tom and I were on. BBC um, Five Live, and then I went on the BBC News to talk about it. I mean, it, it's it, it's it's bigger than we ever anticipated, <laughs> and um, we got there on Sunday, and I think both Tom and I were quite nervous. Like we'd had lots of people register; we had over two hundred people register wow. to come to the event, and um, uh, we I think there was about one hundred and fifty at last count that actually turned up, which is always you know we always knew that. You, you get a dropout rate of these things because of Christmas and, and everything else. Mm-hmm. And, but even then, like Tom and I would just sit there going, oh my God, we thought we'd get like 10 people. <laughs> <laughs> There's a room full of people who are struggling, but equally there was, it was interesting. There were GPs there. There were oh, great. Um, mm-hmm. there. There were coaches there. Mm. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was brilliant. And, and we asked, um, my colleague Nikki Key, who is an incredible, mm-hmm. knowledgeable endocrinologist in this field, like her whole life is hormones, bone health, immunity. You know, she she this whole energy availability and and hormones is is her big thing. Mm-hmm. And Nikki and I met um, earlier this year because um, she was doing a cycling study looking at bone health and um, ended up talking one of her subjects was somebody I had I'd been working with and um, he had mentioned me and so she contacted me and said I need someone like you to work with and do interventions with and so since then we've basically haven't stopped working together because I learned loads from her and equally she learns loads from me and and we've done a lot of collaborative uh, work with the England um, Ballet and um, uh, with different cycling groups and, and running groups. So she came along to the event and talked about kind of the implications, the long-term implications on health, um, which I think was a massive eye-opener for a lot of people in the room. Um, and then we had a couple of individuals, so Tom and another runner, Rowan Priest, and another runner, Anna Boniface, who've all been quite mm-hmm. vocal about their experiences, and they, they spoke about their experiences. And I talked about, I guess, the reason why people develop this, um, this coping mechanism mm-hmm. and use food and training as their means of coping. And again, I think mm-hmm. it just it made individuals sit up and take notice and go, all right, okay, this is now what I understand. Because I think the problem with any sort of disordered eating, eating disorder, is that it's all the focus is always the food and the training, and people don't always appreciate that you know that's just the symptom. Mm-hmm. The reason going on I mean I know you guys are experts in this too and it's it, the real stuff's going on at a much deeper mm-hmm. level mm-hmm. it's got nothing to do with food or body image but it's how they they project it and it's how right. they deal with mm-hmm. that discomfort that that's the real issue so I think suddenly people were like going wow okay that that's me and I had I mean my phone didn't 
my phone could have lit up Oxford Street for two days. <laughs> you know, the notifications and the tweets and the messages and um, people just saying, I mean, for me, the best message I got was, um, I got home that night and the best message I got was, I went for a pizza for the first time in five years. Oh, oh that's I awesome. love those. Yeah. Well, you really uh, did I mean, start something. What do you hope to change by others sharing their story? And where do you envision Train Brave going for like the long term? So we, we do, Tom and I have been chatting nonstop because literally we have been um, inundated with requests to repeat the event that we did on Sunday um, across the <laughs> and country. And yet it's only Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> across the country. So at the moment we're talking about what we'd like to do really is educate um, health professionals and coaches like we felt like the we did a, a suggestion box and a lot of the, the the top messages were you know basically educating others within the field of sport and within health about what are the signs what are the consequences and 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 how do you change it and also like how do you have that conversation and dialogue with people you know I think a lot of coaches are quite nervous mm-hmm. about how to bring up these sorts of topics and conversations and and they don't necessarily understand that sometimes the language they use is 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 the issue and actually that can be easily changed and and it's not a problem you know and I think I mean I'm really lucky I work with some fantastic coaches and um they've always been really respectful of what I say and and have really took on board and they often come to me first and say look Rini we need to have this conversation with this athlete what how would you what would you suggest we do do we do it with you? You know, can you give us pointers? So I'm I'm very fortunate that generally speaking, I've got through to most people I've worked with. There's been a couple of sports where I haven't, but generally speaking, I have. And um, so I think our next steps we've just been we've actually just been emailing back and forth while <laughs> you've been while but while we were trying to set up um, this call. But um, the next step is we're going to try and um, we're going to redo the same event we did on uh, last Sunday in February anybody that missed out and wants to come again um, and then we're going to run some coach education and health profession education sessions um, hopefully at Durham University and also Loughborough University um, over the next six months or so um, obviously you know Tom and I are doing this on top of our day jobs mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. you know we, we're kind of like we're limited to a certain degree by time and I suppose that uh, you know that me on to where where do we see this going I mean we were talking about it last night and I think in an ideal world the long term I guess is that we'd probably quite like like to make it some sort of charity that we can then Mm -hmm. you know kind of develop a a group of trustees and and we can actually maybe run it as a charity and 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 both kind of maybe give it you know a a whole day of our time or, or whatever um ongoing so that we can do it properly and and offer support to those that need it and and like we're also signposting a lot so our website has got the presentations that Nikki and I did on Sunday and we've also got um, signposts to um, another website called the health for performance website which Nikki and I have written um, and it's brilliant it's a really good website for um, health professionals coaches parents and athletes so I think I might have mentioned that on the um, the IFED uh, kind of um uh, round robin a few times like mm-hmm. when people have talked about disorders in sport I've kind of always tried I don't even know if my messages come up but I have put them on there so um but um so we're gonna obviously there's that as well and I know that Nikki has been approached by a colleague of hers who's trying to develop um an NHS clinic um in London so that people who can't who don't necessarily have the kind of funds to to, to kind of work privately with people can can be referred into this clinic and the more referrals we we get into this clinic the more funding we can get and and hopefully we can create you know um something that is again accessible to everybody because that's the biggest problem isn't it is that people want help but we don't have enough resources within the nhs Mm -hmm. and it's not often recognized particularly with i think this group because they often look fairly healthy Mm -hmm. um and equally, there just isn't enough resources. And when you go private, it then adds up from a um, cost point of view. And I, I mean, obviously, people do because obviously their health is really important. But um, we want to try and do as much as we possibly can. Yeah. Well, Renee, let us know when you take it global. 
We, we can be your U.S. ambassadors. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> We'd love it. <laughs> so we love to end every interview, and it sounds like you have a lot you're juggling, but how are you living out the FIT philosophy, trying to balance this performance, health, intellect, and taking time for self? Uh, well, I'm not sure I'm doing a brilliant job of it. But, <laughs> um, but I do, like, the, the things that are really important to me. So I love running, um, but I'm very mindful that it can become something quite obsessive and something mm-hmm. I can also end up kind of using as stress relief if I'm not careful. So I've always, I'm always kind of catching myself and sort of reminding myself that running is. For me, it just really is an opportunity to seek adventure. So recently, I've just come back from Nepal, where I did some running in the Himalayas. And Mm. um, I wasn't fast, because that wasn't the point. But the point was just to enjoy the journey, which I loved. Um, And it was really nice to have that break from uh, the Western world, but also from social media, and actually a little bit of space from um, my practice, because obviously, it gets very intense and um, it's nice to have some time to restore and rebalance myself so I try and regularly book some time in the mountains not necessarily always in the Himalayas but um, often Europe in my case just because I know that that's what refreshes me and restores me and it's kind of my happy place so Mm -hmm. it's it's good so I I do that quite regularly Um, and I also make sure that I I spend time with my friends Um, I try and organize dinner at least once a week with different friendship groups, um, different friends, because for me, like food is so much more than just food. It's, it, it is my opportunity to sit and chat and, and joke and laugh and connect with mm-hmm. the people that I love. And, um, so I know that, you know, spending an evening with a friend over a nice meal, it's not the nice meal I'm going to be focusing on. It's the fact that we've had a connection and a conversation that's mm-hmm. going to let me leave that meal with a sense of well-being so I guess I guess they're my main things is trying to spend time with the people I love and trying to give myself space in the mountains to reflect and restore (laughs) um and just trying to I suppose daily just be grateful for where I am um because you know it's it's been it's been an interesting journey getting to this point and um I think as humans, we're constantly looking for what's next, what's next, what's mm-hmm. next. And I kind of, I'm enjoying where I am right now in the, um, I'm kind of like, I'm doing what makes me happy. I, I feel, I feel comfortable that, you know, my work is reaching people and providing them with comfort and support. And that, that really helps me to feel good about where I'm at. Oh, fantastic. Well, we're extremely excited and we'll be sure to put some of those links in the show notes so our listeners can find it. But thanks for for coming on and we hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you. You too. And uh, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Bye, Queens. Today's episode is brought to you by Yours Truly. I'm excited to announce the releasing soon of my book, Finding Your Sweet Spot in Sport, Avoiding Relative Energy Deficit in Sport, also known as Red S, by optimizing your energy balance. Be sure to follow me on social media or go to my website, www.beccamacomble.com, to find out when the release date is set and when it'll be on Amazon. Bye, Queens. For additional information on today's topic and guests, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Fit for a Queen. And Hashtag Fit for a Queen. And don't forget to rate us on iTunes. We can't wait for you to join us next time on Fit for a Queen. Bye, Queens.